gathering are ready to go. If you have a cell phone, would you turn your cell phone off or turn it to vibrate so that it doesn't ring in our worship service? And if you can stay seated for the whole hour, that would be great so that everyone around you can concentrate on the worship service. The call to worship comes from Psalm 98, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for God has done marvelous things. Please stand as you're able. We're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. <coughs>
that it is our responsibility to make each person a neighbor in your name. So be with us, fellowship with us uh, in this hour of worship. Help us to have a clear vision of you so that we might know who to look for in each other. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The response of reading this morning comes from Psalm 98, verses 4 to 6. I'm going to read what's in the light and have you respond with what's printed in the dark. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. I bring forth into joy a song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre and with the lyre and the sound of melody. With the trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Right. Uh, we stand and pray for the glory of God. Water, it's I'm getting a drink of water. And so 
you can, everything in a flask is not alcohol, amen? Everyone who lifts a flask in worship service is not consuming demon rum, amen? Say amen. 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 Right? They're not all drinking alcohol. Sometimes you just need to wet your whistle. And someone has forgotten to put a bottle of water in the chair. Now, Richard does every week. I've got one, sir, right there. You remember me. Richard now drinks out of a bottle because he doesn't want to be a scandal in our church anymore. Uh, but uh, I, which size was your flask? The medium, medium size. Huh? The medium size. The medium size one. So, he was even drinking lightly, y'all got upset. So, remember, you can know the person before you judge them because God loves them too, right? In Jesus' name, amen. It's a matching set of flags. Okay, um, we haven't sung this one in a long time, but we're going to going to sing it today. Okay? This is all about learning to be holy like Jesus. <coughs> so take time to be holy. <laughs> Perfect life for thine eternity. 
eternity. Where's your sign? 
come forth with confidence. We know that your word says that we can approach your altar, that we can approach your throne with confidence, and that we can speak to you there and that you will hear us. We are so joyful for all of the blessings of this life and for every person who's here this day. Lord, we especially give you thanks that Charles is back with us and that his legs are healing and we pray for a complete recovery. We give you thanks for the warmth of this February and we rejoice that it's meant that we could get outdoors and enjoy a little bit more warm weather a little sooner. But please remind us, God, that spring is not here as well. We give you thanks for the life of Astrid and for the great time she had at the Great Wolf Lodge last weekend. And we pray that we might get to see her again soon. We give thanks for all of those who contributed to Carl's life, blessing Carl's life uh, since he's moved to Del Mar Gardens, and especially for Ken and Dalton who bring him here to worship each week. We give you thanks that Bob is back in Kansas City, that he's surrounded by family now and has a chance to start chemotherapy for his cancer. We pray that you'd be with Jan. Her dog is ill, and God, they become members of our family, and we worry about them. And so we lift Jan up and her dog. We pray for Dennis, who is receiving wound care, and we just pray that those wounds would be healed swiftly and completely, and he might not have further problems with them. God, we lift all of these things up, plus those cases that we kept only in the silence of our heart. As we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. 
Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And then this reading from 2 Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father. When that voice was conveyed to him by the, and the majestic glory saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Please stand for the reading of the gospel as you are able. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The Oxford Dictionary is one of my favorite versions of a dictionary. It's one of the best. It, it really goes into the history of words and, and their meaning. And uh, so I looked up transfiguration. Um, and this is what the Oxford Dictionary says about transfiguration. A complete change of form or appearance. A complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful form or a spiritual state. A more beautiful form or a spiritual state. Now, and the example it gives, of course, is we all know what happens to a caterpillar, right? That is transfiguration. The caterpillar goes um, and appears to die, but then comes out as a butterfly, right? It's certainly a more beautiful form than the worm that it was as it began life. And, in, in, uh, and so, butterflies are good. I'm not sure moths are good, but butterflies, I like butterflies. Okay, so we saw that happen to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration this morning. Jesus went up as this ordinary looking human being up on this mountain, and suddenly he was transfigured before the eyes of Peter and John and James. And he became dazzling white and said, and there appeared with him Elijah, and with him also was Moses. So we see how that form takes place. Now, this question kept nagging at me. I, 
I took my initial notes for this passage six weeks ago, and there's been a question gnawing at me for about six weeks. And that question is, what about you? What about us? Can we become more beautiful people? Can we become more spiritual people? Remember it just said that it's a transition to something more beautiful and a, a, a different spiritual state. Does the Bible say that you can be more beautiful people? Don't look with your eyes now. Can you become more beautiful people in Christ Jesus? Can you become more spiritual? Oh, lots of room for growth, right? You can become more beautiful in Christ Jesus, and we all can become more spiritual. Amen? You agree with me? Yes. All right. So, go forth and be beautiful. Go, no. i got to give you some guidelines, right? I've got to give you some guidelines here, some things. And I find it in the, I find it in the two people that were standing with Jesus when he was transfigured. I, I think there's a message for us in who showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was made into something beautiful, when Jesus was, was shown to the apostles to be in a different spiritual state. Um, Moses and Elijah stood there and they talked to Jesus about his death. Sound like the caterpillar? Who died and then was raised. Amen? And we all want to achieve that too. So here's Moses and here's Elijah. They're talking to Jesus about his impending death. Now, when you see Moses, you think of the law. Or you should. Who was the lawgiver to the, the, the people of God in the Old Testament? It was Moses. So you think about the law. Moses, apart from this mountain, in this transfigured state, is is, is bringing to mind to these three Jewish men who are on the mountain. He, he's testifying about the law of God. Now, I want you to stop and think about what the law has been used for. Right? What the law has been used for. Think about how the law has separated the United Methodist Church because I'm right, and you're wrong, and you're right, and I'm wrong, and we have this law. Think about how we've used it to ostracize other people, to call other people out. Rather than saying to, to Janice, the law says I should forgive you. Right? I should, is that what it says? Love, your, love God. And what? Your Love your neighbor. Amen? Right? So the law says I should forgive you, but I'm sorry, there's a whole decade of your life that is just unforgivable. And so, not only am I going to bring up that decade of her life, the law convicts her and you should not be in the front pew. How dare you? Matter of fact, I'm wondering if you should even be a United Methodist. Have we used the law to ostracize people? Have we used the law to push people to the, to the edges of our community? Have we used the law to say to people, you're not good enough, but I am? Right? If any of y'all think that you kept the law perfectly, may I refer you to the book of Leviticus? Shall I? We'll read that for one solid hour next week and we'll see who the law keepers are and who here need God's grace. Isn't that true? Right? Okay, so we'll put the 613 laws aside and we'll just talk about 10 on the tablets. What's Moses doing up on the mountain? He's gathering up the tablets, right? So we're going to get the, the 10 commandments here on, on the tablets. The ones that can't be on the Wyandotte County courthouse lot anymore. So they're across the street. Right? 
And um, now certainly I understand that it meant you can't keep 613 laws. I understand that. But certainly she can keep all 10 perfectly, right? No. No. You may move to the back pew with your mother. With your mother. Right? And, and this Sabbath keeping, there'll be no dancing. There'll be there will be no card play. Not even a not even a friendly game of pitch. Not old things. We do gambling on old things. There'll be no this, there'll be no that, there'll be no this, there'll be no that. And we know those lawbreakers, and they can't be part of our fellowship. Because it's even hard to keep the Ten Commandments, right? Okay, so Jesus will sit down to two, two laws, two. You shall love the Lord, or you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and eh. Because you give God all that you have every single day of your life, you're never distracted from your love of God. Especially when you remember her decade and that she can't keep 613 laws. So you're remembering the Lord you've got your love, love, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second is like unto this, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. The law fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what it is. What we use the law for. But if you look at just the Ten Commandments, you'll see that the law was used to establish the community of God. The law isn't about separating people out of the community. It's about setting a foundation and a rule so that community can exist. So that we can love one another. I mean, thou shalt not steal. If I'm taking care of these stuff, we're probably not going to live in a community very peacefully. Would you say that? So, first of all, you shall, you shall love the Lord your God. It establishes a foundation for our community. And then the, the not committing adultery and the not stealing and the not coveting your neighbor's manservant or maidservant. Right? All of those, just the Ten Commandments. It's about establishing a community based on our common relationship to God. So, if we violate that foundation, how can the community exist? And if we violate the community, then we violate the, the, the loving God that we built it upon. The law is there so that we can live together as the people of God. So that we can live as the people of God. So that we know how to treat each other. The trouble is, we get into this legalism that begins to ostracize one another. We tend to do the checklist. Sandy did this right, this right, this right, this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. You ever read the gospel when Jesus starts talking about the law? It has been said, but I say to you. It has been said, but I say to you. Jesus puts the heart back into the law to keep us from becoming legalistic. So that we hurt one another by whacking each other with the law. There is no harder book to get hit with than the Bible. Amen? Isn't that true? We are the community of God. We are God's children, all of us. We are all sinners saved by grace. Is that not true? So here Moses is standing on this mountain transfiguration to remind us that we have this law. The first law is to love God. And that is the foundation for the second law, which is to love your neighbor as you love yourself, which establishes the community 
so that we can live as the people of God. Now imagine if we lived as the people of God, would that not be a more beautiful thing? Would it not be a beautiful thing if we lived with every person in love? Would it not be more beautiful if you loved every person? I love Charles. Wilma. I love Kathy. <clears throat> Jim. How does community exist in that atmosphere? What we said this morning in Bible study is true, that you'll never look into the eyes of someone that Jesus doesn't love. Right? And isn't that half the law? The other half is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So you only love Jesus as much as the person you love the least. Because you'll never look into the eyes of a person that Jesus doesn't love. Amen? Two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love the Lord, or love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now we have the foundation for community. We have the foundation to be a more beautiful people. We have the foundation to be a more spiritual people. And that's the definition of transfiguration, is it not? According to the Oxford Dictionary. So we come down to Elijah, the prophet. Now let me tell you what a prophet is not. A prophet is not a fortune teller. If you want a fortune teller, wait till the carnival comes through town and go into the tent with the little glass ball and the lady is, is or the man, whoever it might be, in that tent is robbing you of a $5 reading. Right? Or you can go to that fellow that's in the box at the penny arcade, the scary guy in the turban, you know, that moves around, scares the bejesus out of you, and then shoots a fortune out of the slot. A prophet is someone who discerns the will of God for God's people. A prophet is someone who can discern the will of God for God's people. What if we as individuals immersed in this community built upon this foundation, simply said, God, what is your will for us? Reveal your will for us. When you got up in the morning, if you would say every single morning, God, thank you for this new day. Now, God, what is your will for me this day? What should I do with this day, God, that would glorify you, that would magnify your presence, that would help me to live in a closer relationship with you? God, I know I live in, in, in a relationship with you because Moses, the lawgiver, told me that I should love you and, and that you loved me and he said I should love one another. So God, in that relationship, in that community, God, what is your will for me this day? What is it that you want me to do, God? How can I deepen my walk with you? How can I discern? How many of you ever asked God for God's will? If we get into a foxhole, maybe, yeah? Oh, God, what is your will for getting me out of this trouble? But, God, I'm on the mountaintop today. Everything's going well. I have a beautiful family. I have a beautiful home. I belong to the family of Jesus Christ. And, God, in the goodness of all this blessing, in the goodness of this community, firmly established on the foundation of our faith in you, God, what is your will for us? And what is your will for me as I live into that community? Ask God's will. To start every day by asking God's will. Knowing that every person you see in that day that you're going to go, when you're going to work, when you're coming down to serve groceries, whether uh, you're handing out clothing upstairs, whether you're uh, going over to talk to Mr. Zavala across the street, no matter what, no matter where you're going, you're going to be facing people that Jesus loves. Amen? 
You're not going to encounter one person that Jesus doesn't love. So God, in the face of that community, surrounded by all the people that you love, God, no matter where I go, I... God, we're, they're all there and you love them all. What is your will for me in the midst of that community today? Could that make us more spiritual people? To be seeking the will of God? Rather, I have my plans. I do. There is a thing called the United Methodist Workbook. It has a three-ring spiral. You know how many weeks that plan goes Right? The best laid plans. Right? So God, this is my plan, but God, what I need to know is that your will. Is this what you want for me? Help me to discern, God, your will for me. What is your will for us? How are you going to discern God's will? There's times when I walk through this world and I can't even see Jesus. Amen? There's some pretty ugly things in this world. There's some pretty hard and pressing things in this world. There are just times when, when I'm like Peter. Somehow I know it's good up there, but it's not to build a tabernacle. It's to listen to Jesus. Yeah? And then to go down the mountain and do what Jesus calls me to do. To live in community, to love God, to live in community, and to do God's will. To do God's will. I don't think I can do God's will unless I ask. I don't think I can do God's will outside of the community that God places me in and says, I love these people. I cannot do God's will if I don't wholly lean on the foundation that God has for me. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. Jesus can fulfill that in us. Folks, if not transfer, if not transfiguration, can't we at least be transformed? Does that make sense? Maybe I will never be as beautiful as the Jesus that's transfigured on the mountain. Oh, I sure would like to be, though. Amen. I would. Oh, how I'd like to be transfigured like that. To be more beautiful and to be more spiritual. But I know this. I will never be more spiritual. I will never become a better person than I am right now if I do not build my life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. If I don't love God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all the strength, I can never be more beautiful than what I am today. And I don't mean physically. And I'll never be more spiritual because I'll never be drawing closer to God. And yet the Bible clearly promises, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. We can get a whole lot closer to God. And if we can get a whole lot closer to God, then we can live a whole lot more spiritual lives than what we do. And we can be beautified in that holiness of God a lot more than what we are. Our words can be more beautiful, amen? Our attitudes can be more beautiful. Our thoughts can be more beautiful. Our relationships can be more spiritual. The things we say can be more spiritual. Our witness could be more spiritual. We can be a more beautiful and a more spiritual people. If not transfigured, then let us shoot for transformation. To be new people in Christ Jesus. Yes? And to me, that's what transfiguration is all about. How much God's love can establish us, change us, transform us, and make us be a more beautiful people who live in a more beautiful community and society, more spiritual existence, walking in close fellowship with God. This is what it means to know the beautiness of holiness. 
Swing for the fences. Swing for the fences. Go all in. Take everything that we have and let's give it to our relationship with God. Let us love God with all our hearts and with all our minds and with all of our souls and with all of our strength. Let us give it to God and establish that foundation in our lives so that God can work God's miracle of grace in each one of us. And we can share that with one another. Now transfigure. Why not transform? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to get her some pom-pom. She's my best here Thank you. Okay, um, this is the time when we receive the offering, and so the offering plate is on the back table. Also, I didn't say one of those little gizmos um, that we handed out, but you have one, of, can, can someone just hand me one for illustrative purposes? Okay, we did this last Lent for the first time. Lent comes up on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. Our last Wednesday, our Ash Wednesday service starts at 6 o'clock. And we have these for you. For this is no fair because I'm doing somebody's work. <coughs> well, maybe I am. Um, you fold this together, you make a box out of it, you can decorate it any way you want to decorate it. That's what it's for. And Tara Lee has reminded me today not to use those smeary crayons on it, but use something that won't smear. And what we want you to do all through the 40 days of Lent is to drop your loose change in this box. Right? Just drop your loose change. Put this somewhere in your house, and when you come home, if you have a dime or a penny or a nickel or a quarter, whatever it might be, you drop it in the slot in the top here. On Easter, we'll bring these boxes back to church and um, at the end of Lent, uh, your Easter offering goes in here, a special offering for Easter to go in here. Uh, um, well, I, I'm not going to get that folded all the way, but um, we'll place these on the altar on Easter Sunday after 40 days of collecting your loose change. I highly recommend that when you get the bottom folded, the bottom might quick get folded, but when you get folded, tape it. Because the way that the loose change tends to want to open these up, okay? So put tape there. And for the next 40 days of Lent, as you do your Lenten devotion every single day, as you seek to make your foundation in God more <laughs> secure and your life more spiritual by loving God and loving each other. Remember to give God thanks by dropping just your spare change in this box. All right? The 40 days of Lent do not include Sundays. Sundays are always celebrations of the resurrection. And so the 40 days of Lent minus Sundays. Okay? All right. So whose box? This is Carolee's box. Sorry I bent it up so bad. Let's pray. God of grace, we thank you for this day and for all the ways that you've given yourself to us and now the ways that you call us to give ourselves back to you and to one another so that we might be transformed and made new, reconciled to you and the new people in Christ Jesus. God, we offer ourselves this day to that very thing. God, change us. Make us a new people who love you more perfectly, who find beauty in your holiness, who found spirituality in our dedication to you and to each other. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you're able for the doxology. <coughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Um, Richard installed a clock.
off in the back of the sanctuary as a way of trying to keep me on time. So, but it reminds me of a story of a plumber's son and a minister's son that were comparing notes about their father's occupation. And the, the plumber's son said, this is a pipe wrench. It's, it's used to tighten joints or break joints so that my dad can work on it. And he explained all the tools. And the preacher's son said, well, this is the Bible. This is what my dad works from. He works from this Bible. And, and this is the stand where he sets his sermon and preaches his sermon. And the plumber's son said, well, what's that watch there for? Why does your dad's hand have a watch uh, sitting there? And the pastor's son said, doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> uh, but we are going to get out uh, pretty much on time today. The announcement... Coffee Fellowship meets at 9 o'clock in Manor Hall. Excellent coffee today. Um, uh, our study of the Good Neighbor Experiment is meeting every Sunday at 9.15 a.m. Today we learned about Zacchaeus. Our Ash Wednesday service will be this coming Wednesday at 6 o'clock. That's when Lent begins. That's when you start to use your box. So it's 6 o'clock in the evening. Come and to be in position of the floor, of the ashes upon the forehead. You do not have to have those imposed on your forehead to worship at the Ash Wednesday service, but if you would like them imposed on your forehead, I hope that uh, you will come and, and join us as we begin our Linton journey together. Brigitte could not be with us today. Um, her cat passed away last night. It's a cat they had for 15 years, and so. Um, We'll remember Brigitte throughout this week. She will be with us on Ash Wednesday, um, however. Okay, next slide. Our worship service can be seen weekly on Central's Facebook page. The way to find that page is just to go to Facebook and look up <coughs> Central United Methodist Church, Kansas City, Kansas. Sure, because there was a Central United Methodist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. They have since closed, but um, and they were the rich ones. They, they were the ones that we got the big checks for. We have over. Um, but anyway, uh, make sure you look up the Central Church in Kansas City, Kansas. Our weekday ministries are here. If you would like to be served by any of these ministries, or if you would like to serve, these are the ministries to go to. Our <laughs> congregational challenge. Um, I was telling three ladies from Church of the Resurrection yesterday, they were here, they were volunteering uh, up in the clothing pantry, putting up on the clothes that we had stored up on the balcony on the rack. And I told them that the church's whole budget was like $32,000 and that your part of it was twenty six five, um, And I think they wish their budget was that small. <laughs> so it, this 26 by, you see, it's a blessing, isn't it? It's a blessing that we can do everything we do. And your portion of that is only 26 by. So let's get with it. No. Okay. Birthdays or anniversaries? Any any birthdays? Any anniversaries? You're not going to own up to anything. The hymn of parting is sent forth by God's blessing. Verse 1. <laughs> and joy and peace go with you from this place. 
as the Holy Spirit dwells with you, may you all experience a living law that's written upon your heart. The will of God that comes through deep discernment and the love of Jesus Christ that makes it all possible. In the name of Jesus Christ, go forward and make it a terrific week. Amen. Yes, this Wednesday. Yes. See you guys downstairs, right? Yeah.